you. Uh, my name is Carrie Ivers, and I'm the Planning and Zoning Administrator here at the Town of Irondequoit. I'd like to thank you for coming to the second public hearing uh, related to the Irondequoit Bay Outlet Bridge um, access study. Um, we're pleased to have you all here. In a moment, I'm going to be bringing up uh, Roseanne from Fisher Associates, who's going to kick off the presentation. Just a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Wanted just to let you know that this meeting is being recorded, um, not to track your uh, presence here, but more so that we can share this with the wider community. It'll be um, uh, shown on ICAT. It'll be available on the website. And any of the um, handouts and or opportunities for public comment are also going to be available on the website and people can continue to provide feedback and input. Um, so even if somebody couldn't be here tonight, there, this isn't the only chance to provide uh, your commentary. And so that's to the wider audience who might be watching um, at a future date. So with that, I'm going to pass the um, microphone over to Roseanne and thank you all for coming. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Hope everybody can hear me. If I start fading, let me know. Um, just a show of hands, how many people here attended the first public meeting that we had? Okay, so most of you, but there's, some, there's a few new people. So um, I just want to be aware of that so we can kind of bring you up to speed on some of the... I do have some slides in here representative of the first presentation. So. So hopefully you can follow along. Uh, as Carrie said, we, I'm with Fisher Associates, Roseanne Schmidt. I have team members here, Rick Bennett and Tim Faulkner as well, um, to assist me this evening. And we also have other team partners, um, HDR and Ravi Engineering. They, um, HDR is a, one of the movable bridge experts in the country, and Ravi Engineering participated by performing all the environmental screenings associated with the alternatives. And of course, we had an extensive steering committee involved in this project. Um, some of the members are here tonight, but we continue to work with the steering committee throughout the project and um, get valuable input across this cross-section of people that, that serve on that committee. So for tonight, what we really want to accomplish is um, kind of telling you where we are. Uh, this is kind of an interim meeting. Uh, we don't have final conclusions at this point, but we have done a lot of um, evaluation, collected a lot of data with respect to the various alternatives, and narrowed down the alternatives that we are continuing to evaluate for further consideration. And so we want to present what we've done to date, tell you where we are, what the next steps are, and when there will be some final conclusions and the final report available. Um, we're going to be talking about overall the study tasks, certainly the purpose of the project. Study tasks, just a brief summary of what they are. Um, where we are in the development of, of, of the alternatives, and again, the next steps. And then we're going to have some breakout stations. There's one station up here. This is related to alter bridge alternatives at the outlet. And um, then there's two stations in the other small meeting room outside this room. Um, and those relate to the ramp alternatives. And we'll be discussing what each of these alternatives are. But after the presentation, um, we will have people at each of these stations to answer specific questions you have about those alternatives. There are also comment sheets at each of the stations that you can take and um, fill out whether you support this alternative or you don't and any reasons why or why not. Um, so please visit the stations. Um, that's the best way for us to give one-on-one -on -one feedback and answer questions as comprehensively as we can. Um, so that will be at the end of the presentation. Purpose of the study was to evaluate year-round access across the Bay Outlet. And emphasis was given to um, improving access for all modes of transportation, so vehicular, pedestrians, bicycles, and without compromising um, the Irondequoit Bay's ability to serve as a safe harbor. So that framed the study and our goals in what we were trying to accomplish with looking at all the alternatives. Here's just a laundry list of the study tasks. Um, 
The first public meeting we had focused a lot on our existing conditions analysis. We went out and we looked at traffic counts, we looked at you know environmental considerations that are out there that we need to be aware of, um, and we reported back on a lot of the existing conditions um, that we were dealing with as part of this study. We are at now into the development of the alternatives where we're identifying impacts and costs associated with them. And then we will continue once um, we get done with that with evaluating um, and ranking the alternatives against evaluation criteria that we solicited input from, from the steering committee as well as from the public. Um, following, uh, at the last public meeting, we had um, some breakout sessions where you could rank several different criteria in order of importance to you. And we took that feedback, and then we also posted um, a, a survey online uh, following the last meeting with that same um, exercise, and we received well over 700 responses to that, in addition to the feedback we got at the public meeting. So many people did participate in ranking the evaluation criteria, and we are in the process of finalizing that ranking order, and all the alternatives will then be evaluated against that order of importance of those criteria. Then we will have another public meeting and present all the ranking results, and then complete and submit the final report. So here's some what we have completed to date. I've talked about a lot of it. We've had several steering committee meetings. We had that first public informational meeting back in April. We met with business owners. We conducted online surveys, collected and evaluated traffic data. Um, we did a vessel survey and interviews with marinas around the area, and then identified some concept alternatives with feedback from the public meeting um, that many of you attended. So here's a whole host of concept alternatives that, that came on the table as a result of the last meeting and many of the, um, re much of the research that we've done. Um, anywhere from do nothing, let's leave what we have there, to um, you know, rehabilitating the existing bridge for year-round use, um, and it's a fixed bridge, a couple fixed bridge options, a tunnel, um, a movable bridge, a new movable bridge, similar to what's there, but um, making it year-round, um, and not retrofitting the existing one, but putting a brand new bridge there. And then a couple options that um, are ramp alternatives from Route 104. Um, there's some stub ramps that were never con um, built um, a while back, and so that's one of the alternatives is, you know, what is the feasibility of extending those ramps up to Seabreeze Drive? And then another alternative that came out of the last public meeting was um, Route 104 to Ridge Road connection. So providing some new ramps that get you down to Ridge Road, and we'll explain that alternative. Rick will explain that a little bit in more detail. And then finally, a ferry alternative um, was brought up, and so we added that to the mix to look at preliminarily. So a few of the alternatives fell out pretty early in the process, mainly because of the significant impacts that they had to the area, significantly changing the character of the area, which was not a goal of the project, um, significant costs, property impacts, um, and some logistics issues um, with these alternatives. So the ones in blue fell out early in the, in the process, leaving these as the alternatives for further consideration. The null alternative, rehabilitating the existing bridge for year-round operation, a new movable bridge at the existing uh, location, and then the two ramp alternatives that I talked about and we'll talk about in more detail. Before we get into the um, uh, detailed discussions of the alternatives. I do want to refresh your memory. Some of these slides are from the first public meeting, and I just wanted to bring those up to speed that, that weren't here at the first meeting about the entities that are involved in this project. Um, we have the U.S. Coast Guard, the U.S. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers, Monroe County DOT, Town of Webster, Town of Arundel and New York State Department of Transportation. Um, 
This is just jurisdictional. Those are who have jurisdiction over many of the roads in the area and the waterway. Um, the Coast Guard and the Corps of Engineers have jurisdiction over the waters. And um, there's several other entities. There's New York State Parks that's involved um, and uh, New York State Department of um, Environmental Conservation. So there's a lot of other entities for permitting and those sorts of um, um, issues as well. One thing important to note is that the channel has a horizontal clearance of 100 feet and it ranges in 12 to 16 feet deep, um, depending on how deep it's dredged. Um, generally 12 to 16 feet. And these are the results of, as I indicated earlier, that a vessel survey was conducted. Uh, um, and really what we wanted to know is, is how high would a bridge have to be in this location to pass a significant amount of the boats without opening, having to open and close and, and delay traffic. And so the numbers in yellow at the bottom were the results of the vessel survey. A 50 foot high bridge would, count, would pass about 100% of the boat traffic that resulted from our vessel survey in the area. And then down from there, 40 foot, 95%, uh, 20 foot to 30 foot past 80%, and then a 10 foot high bridge meaning the bottom of the bridge to the, the top of the water, would pass about 75% of the boat traffic. So that was important to guide us in um, looking at how high of a bridge did we want to put in there under the alternatives for an, a new, or, new bridge or rehabilitating the existing bridge. These next couple of slides are just a reminders of some of the environmental issues and conditions that exist out there. There are state wetlands, there's federal wetlands, there's a primary aquifer, there's parklands, there's a couple DEC Superfund sites that, that uh, are in the area, but um, both, both at the outlet, Im here's the image at the outlet, and then here's the image down near where the ramp connections would be made. So this is just a reminder of some of the environmental conditions that we are looking to um, have to deal with and potentially mitigate with some of the alternatives. Here's uh, 2010 data, traffic data that we had um, compiled uh, at the last public meeting. And this basically shows that when the bridge is servicing cars during the winter months, approximately 5,000 vehicles utilize the bridge. And then there's volumes on the surrounding roadways as well. And then when the bridge is closed to vehicular traffic and open to boat traffic in the summer months, obviously zero traffic is crossing the outlet. And you can see the surrounding roadways do experience an increase in traffic volumes as a result. So this is some of the data that was presented at, a, at our first public meeting. And I just wanted to remind you of some of this, this information. Rick's going to now talk about more details about the alternatives that we've looked at. Yay, my turn. Thanks, Roseanne. So as Roseanne said, you know, we've had the process. We've done a lot of data gathering to get to this point, And now we're starting to flesh out the alternatives of what is feasible. And then we can start looking at characterizing the impacts of those potential alternatives and how they would affect the community, either town of Rondequoit, town of Webster, or the community at large. Some of the things uh, that we look at as we're developing the alternatives to be considered are the environmental impacts and considerations. Um, as the previous slide showed, there's the wetlands, there's the parks, endangered species. Those need to be considered in any of the alternatives as far as framing what is achievable and what could be built and what would be prohibitive with regards to an alternative. Traffic and safety evaluation. Providing year-round access to all modes of transportation, we need to look at an alternative and how it could provide that safe access for all, all of the uh, constituents that would be utilizing the, the alternative that's ultimately selected. Uh, property impacts, how any of these alternatives will affect residents, businesses, or community parcels. Uh, there's the park along the, the marine, uh, up at the bay outlet on the west side, how would the, any of these alternatives affect those properties uh, in the area? Mitigation effects, we'll look at any of the alternatives that uh, are continued in this, in this study, what mitigation factors would need to be needed 
to offset any of those impacts that we quantify on a project. Economic impacts, these are both beneficial economic impacts as well as negative cost impacts to the area. Uh, the businesses, residents, uh, drivers, uh, lost time or gained time in their commutes, uh, things of that nature all frame in the uh, economic analysis. Um, we also consider the input from the steering committee, the other stakeholders in the community, the business owners, residents uh, that have provided their comments and uh, data for consideration, as well as all of the public input we've gathered via the uh, original sources that Roseanne mentioned, the previous public meetings, the online surveys, mailed in comments, uh, comments gathered in person. That all goes into the mix to help us develop the alternatives and make sure we're getting a good snapshot of how they will impact the community, either for the benefit or uh, a cost to the community. So moving into those five technical alternatives that we're still considering for further evaluation and detailed consideration. Um, there's not a slide for it, but the first one that we'll continue to consider is the null alternative. It's the do nothing. It's maintaining the existing bridge at the outlet in the, in the existing operational parameters where it goes in place to service cars in the, in the uh, fall time frame. Uh, allows cars to cross over the bay through the wintertime months and then comes out of service for cars, opening the bay to uh, nautical traffic uh, early in the spring so that the boats have access in and out through the summertime. So that's an alternative one. That's an alternative at the end of the meeting. Uh, that'll be up here at the station to the left, or my left, your right, so we can discuss any of the details of that at that location. The first build alternative or alternative that would address year-round access that we are considering is the movable bridge at the existing location, which is a retrofit of that existing swing bridge that's out there. And what we're looking at doing is salvaging part of the bridge structure, the superstructure uh, that's out there, rehabbing it, raising it up, and putting in new mechanisms, new abutments, uh, new gearing, new controls to allow it to open at a more frequent manner. Uh, to do that, we also have to consider some of the vehicular safety gates that would need to be in to control vehicular traffic on Lake Road and Culver as they approach the bridge site to make sure if the bridge is up that the cars are able to stop and uh, be uh, safely uh, addressing, um, so, excuse me, to safely stop the cars as they approach the uh, opening so they don't drive into the, the outlet when the bridge is up. Um, we looked at the vertical clearance increase. The existing bridge out there provides four feet of under clearance in the wintertime months. And as Roseanne mentioned, when we did the nautical survey, the vessel survey, raising that to 10 feet passes 75% of the expected boat traffic that's on the bay underneath without having to open up the bridge. So the bridge would only have to open for the taller vessels, the sailboats or um, the cabin cruisers that have the, uh, the taller structure above the water. So that helps us frame less openings, allows more vehicular traffic to cross the bay while still serving the majority of the nautical vessels. So this helps frame what we're looking at. So that's the first alternative that's being considered uh, as a solution. Looking in plan view top down, we characterize some of the impacts uh, in plan view as to fit in a retrofit of that existing bridge, raising it up that to provide that 10 feet of underclearance, which is raising up the profile of the road about six feet from the existing level of the bridge. So it's raising it up and the roadway approaches would have to come up as well to provide that connectivity to the bridge. So to provide that on the west side here, approaching from Culver Road, the roadway would start to go up uphill to uh, align with the new bridge, the raised bridge over the outlet, and then progress over into Webster, again at the about six feet higher than is out there today, and then come on down and match in with the existing lake road. To do that, the other areas, the parking lot areas in gray, and some of the cul-de-sac over here on the eastern side of the outlet at the western end of Lake Road, and some of the, the parking area in that area, and the driveway entrances to the businesses would also have to be reconstructed or mitigated to facilitate that raise in, in topography of the ground out there and make sure everything blends back in. 
Um, for this option, one of the things to note is part of the parkland and the marine and the boat launch in the marina side, uh, the public boat launch, as well as the restroom building, that would all be affected by this option as well and would need to be mitigated and reconstructed as part of the alternative. So we're starting to frame what would need to be done to fit the bridge and that'll help us with characterizing the amount of impacts to properties. There are eight neighboring properties in this area. Some of those are public. Uh, for example, the park area over here, you have Mayor's Marina over on this side and then there's some private residences in that area as well uh, that would be affected or uh, they're neighboring the project site so they would be impacted to varying degrees. So we would have to characterize both right away as well as mitigations, um, how that will affect those properties and that will go into the evaluation of this alternative. Looking at a second option at that same location is the a new, brand new movable bridge. Um, one of the ones that we're considering is a rolling lift, uh, which technical drawing is down here and a sample of a type of movable bridge that's a rolling lift is shown there. Similar characteristics for how the ground would relate to the bridge and the footprint of the bridge. Um, we would still also need the same type of vehicular safety gates at the approaches of the roadway to control traffic and make sure everyone's moving in the same area. And we would look to provide that same 9 to 10 feet of underclearance to pass those nautical vessels. Because it has a similar footprint and the similar characteristics, it's the same impacts to those residents up there. So both alternative two, the retrofit of the existing bridge, and alternative three here, the brand new movable bridge, are also going to be discussed at this breakout station over here at the end of the state at the end of the meeting so we can answer any specific questions for how th the project alternatives may impact a property, what we talk about with regards to the grade and how we are expecting uh, mitigations to have to, to fit in here. For both of those retrofit of the existing swing bridge and the new movable bridge, when you look at nationwide standards and how these type of bridges would most likely operate, um, there's a typical bridge operation cycle here where to bring the, there would be signals involved and to go to like a flashing red to stop the vehicles and then lower the gates in a safe manner takes about a minute and a half to then once those gates are down to open the bridge to allow nautical traffic takes another minute and a half providing a couple minutes for a vessel to move through assuming it's a sailboat that's operating under motor about five miles an hour to come out of a mooring area navigate the channel, get on the other side, providing about a couple minutes there to travel that couple hundred feet that they need to do. And then to go ahead and close that bridge span takes another minute and a half. And then once the bridge is closed and seated, you go ahead and open up the gates and turn it back to a green, if you will. That takes about 30 seconds at that point. So that whole cycle time is somewhere in that neighborhood of about seven minutes on a typical uh, consideration. So this goes into our, our framework for when we go and analyze the impacts and how it's going to affect vehicular traffic uh, while we're providing access for the boats through there. And again, this type of operation under any of these uh, alternatives, one of the controlling factors would be a, a opening schedule that is predictable and that is advertised. So working with the Coast Guard and the Army Corps engineers, that schedule would be vetted out and set when a project comes into place to put a movable bridge in at this location. A typical operating schedule may be operating <sighs> where the bridge opens for 10 minutes on the hour every hour or opening for 15 minutes but off peak of the vehicular travel demand. Uh, so when the most cars are using it, the bridge stays closed and to allow cars to go through and the vessels would have to wait. So that type of operational schedule would be vet it out and establish when the project goes to establish any type of bridge in that area. This is a typical operating schedule to help us characterize and compare the alternatives. So I bring up our, our traffic expert Tim to talk through some of the impacts of what that operation schedule would look like from regards to traffic. So. What we did here is, um, if you remember back at our first public meeting, we did some traffic counts. Um, 
We did some traffic counts down here on Seabreeze Drive. We did some over here on Culver, and then we did some over here on Lake Road to characterize what the traffic is during the times of the year when the bridge is open to traffic. Um, and then in August, we did some additional counts in essentially the same locations. We did them here on Seabreeze Drive, here on Culver, and the ones on Lake, we took closer over to Bay Road just to get, uh, you know, how much traffic is really going down uh, Lake Road during the summer months, but only going, only staying in this section. So what we really found was, and I, it wasn't, you know, rocket science, but, you know, traffic significantly dropped off on Lake Road and dropped off on Culver Drive. But we did see the difference between the winter and summer traffic of about a 12% increase on Seabreeze Drive during the summer. So traffic is about 12% higher on Seabreeze Drive. So then in order to really kind of come up with, you know, what the projected queue lengths would be when the bridge goes up and we got to stop all the traffic, we had to kind of develop, you know, what, make, it a, make some assumptions on what traffic would be like on the summer if there was a bridge there. And based on previous traffic data that was gathered many years ago when there was a bridge here in the summer, the information that was provided by the Genesee Transportation Council and the Regional Travel Demand Model, and also looking at the area traffic counts, we came up with a very conservative assumption that the traffic is going to be about 50% higher during the summer months going across the bridge. So if you remember, in the earlier slide, we had about 5,000 going across the bridge during, during March. So we're saying roughly 7,500 cars around that area, 7,500 to 8,000 would be crossing the bridge in the summer months. So from that, we look at the, the distribution of traffic over the day to see, you know, to see how much traffic is going to be queuing up. And on the weekends, if this bridge was to go up on a weekend during the peak time of day, which is typically in the, the 2 to 3 o'clock range, you would have queues, traffic would be backing up roughly 1,200 feet on the, the Lake Road side and about 1,100 feet on the Culver Road side. So gates go up, first, or the gates come down, traffic stops, it's come back up about 1,200 feet. So roughly 40 cars, 30 to 40 cars. Um, and then it would take approximately a little less than two minutes for that total queue to dissipate. So after the, the bridge comes back down, the gates go up, that last car in line is going to be, it's going to take them almost two more minutes to get across the bridge because it's roughly two seconds per car to get everybody across. So that's what it is on the weekends during the worst time of day. So that's, this is like the highest volume during the, the mid-afternoon time frame. So then we looked at what's, gonna, what's it look like on a weekday where you're going to get the commuter traffic plus you also get the, the, the tourist traffic and all of that stuff that goes on and up in this area. And you can see the queues are a little bit longer because traffic volumes are a little higher. On both sides of the bridge, it's, it's roughly 1,400 cars, which is about, or 1,400 feet, which is about 54, 55 car queues that will be backing up again. Take about two minutes for that, that queue to dissipate. Um, but again, this is very conservative in terms of what we assumed in terms of the growth of the traffic on the bridge. Um, judging by what we saw on Seabreeze Drive with only a 12% increase in traffic, um, we wanted to guess on the high side, make some assumptions on the high side in terms of what we think is going to be across here. Um, and like Rick said, um, there are ways to mitigate this. You know, these, this time period is from 3 to 4 and 4 to 5 every day during the weekdays. That's when the peak traffic crosses the bridge. So, uh, you know, maybe during this time frame, the bridge is not, the bridge doesn't open. You know, it stays closed between three and five. So to facilitate the traffic flowing through this area. Um, so <coughs> with that, I'll turn it back over to Rick. Great. Thank you. So those are the, the, considering the null turn the other two, those are the alternatives for solutions up at the outlet itself. Other ones that we considered are a connection of Route 104 to Seabreeze Drive. This is uh, the, the midway down the bay to the south. Um, looking at this stretch here is Route 104 between coming from the east out of Webster, heading in to Arondicoit, and then ultimately out towards Greece. And you have Seabreeze Drive coming down through here through the Titus Ave roundabout, and then heading south on Route 590. So. The original, as you come across the Bay Bridge, there are two 
stub ramps that were in that were built as part of the 1960s project. They're out there today. They're not connecting to anything. I'm looking at that as a connection point to Route 104. We looked at coming through the ravine on the west side of the bay and coming up and making a connection just north of, of Titus Ave uh, to the north of the roundabout. Um, part of the reasons of that geometry and that alignment that we had to consider is that the uphill grade there needs to be limited to about 5% uphill grade maximum. Uh, and that's for safe operating in wintertime conditions, larger trucks being able to navigate ramps on an uphill grade, things of that nature. So safe operations, again, limit us to about a 5% grade. The existing elevation difference between the Route 104 bridge ramps and the Titus Ave roundabout location is 75 feet in vertical difference. So almost an eight-story building change there. So we had to extend the ramp connections farther north to limit us to that uh, keep us below that 5% threshold. So the alignment brings us up through here, crossing Titus Ave extension to the east. Um, to make that work, Titus Ave extension would be uh, a bridge structure carrying Titus Ave extension over the two ramps coming up from Route 104. So there would be the ramp structure in that area would be about 20 feet below Titus Ave extension in that area. So the ramps would be coming uphill and there would be a bridge carrying the local neighborhood traffic over the top. And then those two ramps come up, the, the Route 104 westbound ramp would come along and tie in with five, um, excuse me, Seabreeze Drive northbound, just merge right in and, and continue on. The southbound operation coming down Seabreeze Drive out of Rondecoit would divert off and come to a stop sign and have to cross over that northbound traffic and then would be able to continue on to Route 104 heading out towards Webster. So that's the geometry that could work. And when we look at starting to frame the impacts and what it would take to go ahead and build something like this, uh, we know that in that shaded green area is kind of the footprint of either bridge structures, retaining walls, uh, earthen embankments to make this alignment work. We start to look at there's an impact to approximately 17 properties in this area. Um, Another characterization of this is that this does not truly provide pedestrian or bicycle access because of the length of trip around the bay to get to the destination where those outlet bridge alternatives provide that direct connection for pedestrians and bicyclists. So again, looking at all those modes of transportation that we're considering and how to provide safe alternatives, we're characterizing that as part of the impact of this project, uh, this alternative as well. And then there are some of the known traffic data, as Tim mentioned, getting some of that input from the GTC travel uh, demand model, where people would distribute and how they would travel if this option were built. Uh, we're looking at approximately 8,600 cars per day heading northbound. And we're looking at about 3,500 cars per day utilizing the two ramps, uh, the connections to Route 104. And then in the peak hours, those are the numbers that we're looking at right along at the uh, cross connection there between Seabreeze Drive southbound and the uh, 590 North, uh, Seabreeze northbound and the connection ramp to Route 104. I apologize for that. A second alternative down to make connection between Seabreeze Drive or in this case uh, Route 590 and 104 is to move that connection down to Ridge Road. And in this graphic and both of these alternatives are in the breakout station in the small meeting conference room off to the side. Um, what's going on here is we would look to introduce a new Route 104 westbound off-ramp coming up here and tying in with the Route 590 southbound off-ramp and then ultimately making a connection at the stop sign on Ridge Road. Heading in the other direction coming off the, the Ridge Road to Route 590 Northbound on-ramp would be a new off-ramp that provides connection to Route 104 eastbound. So this is a, a connection that's doable from a geometric standpoint. It's a little less direct than the other connection up further north on Seabreeze Drive. This meets that criteria of limiting the grades to that 5% grade maximum. Um, a significant impact to this one is that the two bridges carrying Route 590 over Route 104 would have to be completely reconstructed to provide the, the footprint to allow for that 
off ramp from Route 104 westbound to come through. We need additional pavement space down below to make that width to make the safe off ramp. So that would require require both of those bridges to be reconstructed. Again, this does not provide the uh, direct pedestrian or bicycle access. Um, in this area, there would be no property acquisitions because it's all within the existing interchange and municipally owned land uh, for the transportation network. And the GTC model shows that those ramps are still, the 104 westbound ramp is providing access to about 3,200 vehicles would utilize that ramp in the model. And then heading the other way, it jumps to about 6,800 vehicles. And what that model is showing is that under this configuration, travel patterns are being redistributed. Um, instead of that direct connection heading north into Rondequoit along Seabreeze Drive, we see some of this providing access to Ridge Road and those destinations are being served more. So that's why we're getting dissimilar travel. Um, some of those people coming out of the western part of Rondequoit are coming down Ridge Road and jumping on to go off to the east is what the, the model is showing here. We started to put some conceptual costs to the various alternatives. Um, we had presented costs before, which were a roll-up of a true 75-year, just what is it going to cost periodically over those years. We brought those numbers back to a present worth to uh, calibrate to present dollars for all the different alternatives. Um, when we looked at this, we looked at construction costs to put one of these alternatives in place. That's the top line. We looked at the annual operating costs or maintenance costs to maintain the structure. Um, the movable bridges require a, a larger maintenance cost yearly as well as an operating cost. You have to staff it with personnel to go ahead and open and close the bridge and anytime anything's moving there's more maintenance to it than when something is stationary. Uh, so we characterize that in there. Um, with any option regardless of how it's operated there's those expected repair costs as things age out over a 75 year period. Um, and then at the end of it, the study uh, program period of 75 years, there would be a, a salvage cost or a residual value of what that infrastructure is that's out there. And that's this bottom line. That's a net benefit back to the project. So in economic terms, when we put it together, we get a total life cycle cost that we can use to help calibrate and compare the benefits of any of these alternatives against the cost to go ahead and build it. Where does the money come from? Who the that is not determined as part of this. This document, the study would characterize what a, a type of project would be and then one of the municipalities that want, or Just agencies. Corps of Engineers involved in that cost at all. In characterizing what it would be, yes, they're part of the, the study team. But as far as funding it, that has not been determined yet. There has not been any funding streams identified for a follow-on project. Do you know what the district is for the Army Corps of Engineers in this area? Yes. Do you know how broad it is? Yes. It goes from like one I, I understand. It's, it, we do, and, and I'd, I'd like to hold on that and just keep going with the presentation, if we will, and I'd love to have a conversation with you afterwards about that well, aspect, but we, we have been in contact with them. So. Can I just say one thing about that? The most times, people think that it's coming out of New York State's pocket for paying for this, and it isn't, because it's shared with Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York. And every time we turn the project down to New York, guess what? What I would say. Ohio, or yep. those, and, those are the ones that we are right. They always got all that money that we always turned out. And I appreciate that comment, and I would ask that at the breakout station, if you would be so kind, put something like that in writing so it can be part of the study record. <laughs> so just to, to keep on track uh, for the, the presentation here. Early on in the process, developed evaluation criteria. This will be the metrics that we score any of the alternative, all of the alternatives against. So we're comparing each of those alternatives against these 11 evaluation criteria. As Roseanne mentioned, stakeholder meeting discussed these. The first public information meeting, the public that was here, some of you uh, may have participated in voting on prioritizing these as far as most important to least important. 
in the context of this study, as well as a follow-on survey where we had a little over 700 participants weigh in and, and prioritize and rank these as well. We're taking all of that data from the, the two different public input sessions, the online survey and the public information meeting and steering committee, and balancing all those out to finalize with a ranking of these 11. As they're depicted up here, they're not in that order yet, but this is just giving a snapshot of how we're going to measure each of these alternatives. Cost, property impacts, environmental impacts, aesthetic, how well it provides that year-round access, the operation and maintenance costs, and the construction impacts, how um, uncomfortable will it be to build one of these options, things of that nature. As we get into next steps, we're going to finalize that economic analysis of the costs and benefits of all the alternatives and how they affect the communities. With each of these alternatives, we'll drill down and uh, quantify all the environment, um, environmental impacts to endangered species, to the wetlands, things of that nature. We'll coordinate with those agencies that have jurisdiction, whether it's the transportation agencies, or the Army Corps of Engineers, the Coast Guard, who has nautical jurisdiction. We'll finalize those alternative rankings and how the alternatives score. We'll bring that data back out for another public information where we can identify objectively how those alternatives rank out from the best alternative that meets the most project objectives to the alternative that meets it the least. After that public information meeting, we'll go back, we'll finalize the report, and provide a final report to the town. Uh, the schedule to, to close out, we'd anticipate those, that additional public information meeting and the work that still needs to be done taking us through to the end of the year. So with that, um, we're going to start to transition to the breakout sessions where we can answer questions one-on-one. -on -one and discuss the project alternatives.